if it's actually smarter than us, eventually it will do most decision making and we won't be able to turn it off or undo that decision. So we're hitting very close to point of no return. Most people don't even realize there is a problem. You can't predict what this super intelligence system will do. You cannot explain it. You cannot comprehend it. You cannot control it. You cannot communicate with it without ambiguity. You cannot uh, properly monitor it. So that's, that's the whole set of problems I'm looking at right now. Hi, it's Ranchix. The following is my conversation with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. He is one of the leading experts on the topic of AI safety. Whether you realize it or not, artificial intelligence is part of our lives. It is affecting everyone already. What is AI? How does the future look like? How our lives are affected by it? What is intelligence? What does it mean to be human? Does AI have emotions? Does it perceive art? Yes, I'm not kidding. These are some of the questions we discuss, and I feel that every answer pops up multiple new queries. Of course, we also discuss the dangers that AI, the bots, and the real-time assistants pose to the poker industry. In fact, 12 years ago, Roman was seriously considering becoming a professional poker player himself. I'm glad he didn't, because he is doing some extraordinary work in his field. And if you feel like diving down that rabbit hole, in the description you will find the links to some of Dr. Rampolsky's work. As always, we have timestamps in the description, so if you want to, just jump to the topic that interests you the most. And I hope you will enjoy this conversation with Dr. Roman Yampolsky. So anyway, Roman, uh, what a pleasure. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. I re- was really looking forward to this conversation. So uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's, it's such a pleasure. And a topic today, AI, something that I'm really curious about. And uh, I, yeah, I, I, I don't even know where to start because there's a multitude of issues. And maybe let's just set the framework to what is AI? What are we talking about in general terms? And then we you know, go into the weeds and into the details of the whole thing. Sure. So AI is our best attempt to automate human labor, both physical and cognitive. Teaching computers to do things usually reserved for people. And uh, as we get better at it, we become more ambitious. We're not just trying to match human performance, but actually exceed it in many domains. Okay. And obviously, to me, the, the, the glaring examples of where the technology is being mostly worked on and, and applied with good success is, um, well, self-driving cars. We're still a long way from there, but self-driving cars definitely comes to mind. All the algorithms for search and, uh, for example, the Facebook algorithms, uh, recommendation algorithms, um, which are also based on some sort of machine learning. So these would be the two that stand out to me. And obviously, there's probably a lot of applications in military, in bioengineering, all those types of fields. So in general, you know, when we talk about AI, we talk about something that is huge, in a sense. But at the same time, we see applications of AI in games like chess and games like poker. And it always feels like this is really interesting, but this is just like a stepping stone. It's, it's only like a little playground to test the ideas to further apply them in, in the bigger fields. Is that, is that how it is? Games have always been a sandbox for AI. Since early days, whatever, it's checkers or chess, we always tried getting things to work in this much more controlled environment. It's easy to see if you're winning or losing. Scoring is easy. So it's been true for a while. Uh, You mentioned that we see examples of AI everywhere. I agree. It's easier to list uh, things where AI is not a big deal, where we're not using it for something. It's a much shorter list. It's uh, completely dominating everything we do, whatever it's stock market trading, military response, power plants, it doesn't matter. AI is definitely uh, a big part of that Mm -hmm. domain. And and especially interesting is that it became a big part of that domain 
in a relatively short period of time. Right? Because we well, were basically it's been building up. It's been building up for a while. The problem with AI for many years uh, has been that once we succeeded something, we stopped calling it AI. So you have a spell checker in your Microsoft Word or something. You don't think of it as artificial intelligence. It's just a software tool, something. So the moment we get there, we go, no, no, no. AI is this much harder thing we don't have yet. Mm. But uh, I was trying to kind of figure out what's the smallest unit of intelligence in software. An if statement, right? If you have some sort of a decision-making system, that's AI. It may not be human level, but that's the least you can do. So your thermostat, anything like that is already making intelligent decisions. Oh, that's interesting. Because basically then the question is what is intelligence in a way? Because is it just the decision making? How do we define it right now, actually? What is the holy grail? Because like, what is the aspiration right now? Where are we get going? Right. So there is a nice paper looking at about 50 different definitions of intelligence, and they try to combine it. And what they arrive at is something like ability to win in any environment. If you're playing poker, if you're flying a plane, if you're trading stocks, it doesn't matter. You're going to win in that environment. You have general intelligence. You can figure out how to beat everyone, compete with other agents, acquire resources. And there are many sub problems you have to solve. You need to do pattern recognition, compression, processing, visualization. But at the end, what you're trying to do is achieve certain goals in a different set of possible environments. Right. Hmm. To win, basically, is the goal, right? But However you decide that uh, definition, right. what does that okay. mean to win? What does it mean to win? <laughs> All right. Because, yeah, that's also like, you know, instinctively, like as soon as I hear the goal is to win, it feels like not all games are meant to be won and have a winner and a loser. But then again, how do you define winning? You know, perhaps. How uh, do you win at life? Yeah, that's a exactly. big philosophical question. Exactly. Interesting. Well, anyway, let's jump into discussing. AI applications in poker, and, and then we progress further into more general discussion about the topic of AI. Um, so first, first of all, like maybe I'll just give you the ball and, and you roll with it, and then I'll follow up on, on something. So where is AI going, and how is it going to affect poker and poker players and poker industry? What, what is your opinion on that? So we can look at what happened to other games, games like chess where AI succeeded sooner. And uh, we see a lot of problems, especially with online chess. I think cheating is uh, rampant uh, at all levels, not just uh, top professionals, but even kind of high school kids and beginner players. Uh, there is some research on how to detect that, how to be able to notice that someone's playing style is uh, well beyond their capability consistently. Mm -hmm. So if you cheat at a single move, you get help with one move. We can't detect that statistically, but if you consistently perform miracles one after another, uh, that can be detected. And we have examples of that uh, at tournaments, at uh, you know significant events where it impacted the uh, outcome of uh, of the competition. And I think as a result, one thing you're not going to find a lot of is uh, playing chess for money online. Mm -hmm. It's just not a smart decision. And I think we'll have something like that with poker. Uh, I was doing research on it as part of my PhD dissertation, which is now about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I was collecting data. I was realizing, okay, there is more and more bots playing. And they weren't amazingly good, but it was good enough to collect bonuses in a casino and collude with other bots. So I was uh, trying to prevent participation from bots, detecting them, profiling which bot is it, are they working together? So that was part of my uh, research in security and safety against low-level AI, you can say. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it's only going to get worse. That was one of the reasons I decided not to become a professional poker player. At the okay. time, I was very much into poker, and I was like, do I want to do 
science after I graduate or do I want to play poker? And this was uh, probably the main main factor in my decision. I think I'm happy with my decision. You are a professional poker player, so you can tell me if I made a good decision or not. Well, I think as long as you love what you're doing, that's the definition of winning, right? So an intelligence would just choose the happiness above the, you know, the 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 path that somebody recommends you. So I, it looks to me you get, made a great decision because you've published so many papers. You're passionate about your subject, and you know the question of whether you would have made uh, a lot of money along the way in poker. I, I I think it's an irrelevant question. That doesn't matter. I agree with that, but if you measure winning through happiness, there are easier ways to to get there, and a lot of them are not what we're looking for. So that's very difficult to explain to machines why wire heading, direct uh, stimulus of pleasure centers is not what we have in mind when we look for happiness. Mm. Well, again, yeah, because everything comes to the language definition of what is winning, what is happiness, right? Because it, are, are we looking at happiness from a short term, uh, just uh, sort of instinctive pleasures that you're getting in the moment or are you looking for things which are hard to quantify like fulfillment in life you know do you wake up in the morning thinking like okay i have a mission i need to do this right this is part of happiness for some people for some it's not so again like it, it's probably pretty hard to to figure these things out but yeah i mean at the same time now your 12 years ago, uh, the things that you were thinking about seems quite prophetic, even though, I mean, it, it wouldn't come to a big surprise to anyone that, you know, we are bound to come to a point where uh, real-time assistants and bots are just going to be really strong compared to a human player. Mm. What do you think are the biggest risks and how, what steps can poker players and poker sites and the poker community take to mitigate those risks? Well, the biggest advantage is that computers have perfect memory, right? They can look up every game you ever played. They can have a complete database. They know you better than you You know yourself on average. They can exchange information in certain ways. So you're sometimes playing against multiple bots at the same time. Uh, I'm surprised humans are still as competitive as they are given performance of AIs in heads-up poker and improvements in full-scale games. So I think it's only a question of time before a game is completely dominated by AIs and humans don't have much to offer, just like we see in chess. Mm -hmm. um, what can poker sites do? Is there anything poker sites can do? Because in chess, you know, if we uh, compare the complexity of the two games, right? In chess, it's a game of full information. So when you're making a above human level move, so to say, a move that is clearly, uh, you know, just thinking like 50 moves ahead and calculating every, every line, and you consistently do that, it's glaringly obvious. Now in poker, incomplete information game, Plus, as the algorithms get better, we see more often that what used to be close to, you know, optimal strategy, uh, perceived optimal strategy uh, over years, you know, with better technology, better algorithms, that also becomes a losing strategy, right? Because all of a sudden there is a better winning strategy. So what is the benchmark that we compare the decisions to? Because, you know, some decision that is made by a superior strategy might seem absolutely a mistake if we um, look at it from a lens of a simpler strategy. Yeah, so what what is possible, and it, it's not a solution, but maybe kind of short-term measures, is to look at uh, distributions for human players, including mm -hmm. well-known good players, and just looking for outliers from that. How does a casino know you're cheating? You are winning. If you keep winning, we know you're cheating. I don't need to know anything else. Now I'm just waiting to catch you. Mm -hmm. So that's really the strategy. If someone is multiple standard deviations above the best players, 
how do they do it? It's not because they are that much better naturally. Statistics don't work like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I am uh, I'm getting paranoid now because it 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 doesn't seem like a good outlook, but uh you can still have fun you and your bot, you develop different strategies, you compete as bots and it's kind of more of a gambling than a skill mm -hmm. situation. So it's possible there is still interest but it kills chances for unassisted players or for beginners. Right. Um what do you think about the ideas of some poker sites are toying with an idea that, especially for the higher stakes, you would introduce um, two angles of video, so two cameras while you play, um, so constant monitoring plus, you know, perhaps audio monitoring, uh, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, just to visually control that the human is actually operating and making the decisions unassisted. What's your take on that? We have a lot of the similar problem with uh, online education now, especially with pandemic. Mm -hmm. How do I know it's the student taking the exam? Yeah, we can lock in their browser. We can have a camera. But at the end of the day, I don't even know if it's the same student. I don't know if there is someone else in that room touching their food. There is a lot of ways to transfer information. You mentioned uh, uh, lighting and visual sound options, but there are other ways I can transmit information, send signals, I can spoof cameras, I can spoof audio signal, especially on large scale with uh, many players in a casino. It's very hard to monitor. You can catch some obvious problems, but uh, if we're talking about a significant amount of money, I'll always find a way to transfer information to someone which will not be obvious to you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what seems weird to me is that the opportunity for cheating seems to be there, yet the scale of cheating that we are aware of is still relatively low. What? Why? Because it seems like monetary... Top level of play or what uh, low level I'm, stakes? I'm talking about the top level of play because low level of play, let's assume there's a lot of bots, but then again, we're talking about bots who are probably making money uh, by colluding and sharing cards, but not necessarily with the just having a very superior strategy to human players, right? Well, that's at least my assumption. I'm not sure if it's still true. It was certainly true 12 years ago. You made money through bonuses and other means, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's still true, especially for, you know, maybe not a 10-player game, but smaller games. Okay. The AI is getting really good. All right. But obviously, there's different games as well, right? In, uh, in, in No Limit Hold'em and in PLO, Pot Limit Omaha, the game tree is the number of nodes is just exponentially higher. So one game theoretically is more complex. It is vulnerable to card sharing because now you have more cards to share and you get uh, immediately a higher advantage, but at the same time, solving the game to a very high precision and a, a very superior strategy is not an easy task. Yeah. Right? But how can we think about, like, so do you think that the online poker currently is bot infested or is it still just a, a small scale? So again, I stopped following it some years ago, mm -hmm. looking at how bad it was 12 years ago and constant progress in that field. I would be really surprised if it didn't get much, much worse, except for the very top levels. All right. Can you tell me about like what did you see 12 years ago? What were some of the things that stood out? What did you notice? For very low stakes, uh, most tables were dominated by bots. It was mostly bots. Mm -hmm. You could find yourself as the only human at the table sometimes. Right. How could you detect that? What was your approach to detecting a bot? Well, they were games? just terrible. They were really bad bots. Like you could... You could use trivial things. Even chat option would would let you figure out what you're doing, what you're dealing with. Okay. 
It was um, early days where people were like, anyone would just buy a framework, set a few rules and release the bots on the casino, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> if we know for a fact that AI dominates best players, right? In heads up, for example. And this is uh, either completely open source, so you can finish the model if you have some skills. Why would why would it not be used a lot more? Do we know for sure that AI completely dominates human player? For, for like specific games, mm-hmm. let's say limit uh, heads up hold them. Yeah, yeah, there are competitions where humans lost yeah. consistently. Yeah, by a yeah, lot. That- that's right. So in the in the specific games, um, that is definitely the case. All right. Well, obviously, poker sites are taking a lot of measures, especially the bigger ones. The you know the more reputable poker sites are taking a lot of measures, working um, with big departments in in trying to catch uh, assistants and trying to catch the bots and. From what I know, a lot of those sites are actually doing a good job and succeeding. Do they report statistics on how many they catch, percentages, growth, anything? um, I haven't followed it in a while. Well, some sites report statistics, but that to me many times feels like more of a marketing stunt and a PR stunt. Um, I'm more impressed by knowing that you know, there are things that are going on which they don't report. Makes me feel safer because I feel like, okay, you're doing it for the good reasons. You're not just trying to, you know, um, sort of signal to the world that, hey, we we catching bots, et cetera, et cetera, and play here. You know, when you're doing it consistently without signaling, I feel like, okay, you're on the right track. You're, you're actually doing it. Mm. So I don't know the statistics. I mean, occasionally some sites would publish and obviously community is... Uh, taking care to analyze data as well. Community of players, as soon as there's suspicion, you know, obviously all the data or a lot of the data is available and you can just run and as you were describing, you know, just run and see the um, win rates, see the um, de- standard deviations, et cetera, et cetera, just to have a statistical understanding of whether that's even possible, whether that's likely. Because uh, to be honest, everything is possible. Everything has at least some probability to happen in poker but is it really likely right so there's a lot of that going on at the moment yeah i don't know i i am sort of perplexed now because from one side you know on a human level i just have the hope that this is not going to ruin the game that we're going to find a way of um Obviously, there will need to be some changes to poker, right? And a lot of discussions are going into the direction of perhaps we need to introduce more entropy in in the game. So introduce additional randomness, which would make the algorithm less efficient because it wouldn't be able to deal with uh, increased complexity in the game, especially if the complexity increases randomly. Like we would, uh, you know, uh, add specific amounts of money to the pot before the hand or you know we would remove some cards from the deck or change the whole composition so basically make it harder for the bot but it always is going to be a race against time it always going to be okay we introduce something it's going to take the developers of those algorithms and and machines a bit of time and then they're on it again also oh, you will lose all the beginners if they get confused easily by constantly changing rules and randomness uh, yeah. it's just a couple top players trying to get money from each other mm. why do you think poker players play like you chose not to play i chose to play i mean okay i 12 years ago i didn't know that hey there's probably a lot of bots if i knew i might have made the same decision as you but um because in fact, I, w- I started playing poker about 12 years ago, about 12, 13 years ago. So the time frame is exactly right, you know. And from your perspective, it was clearly a no. From my perspective, it was clearly a yes. And I, I feel like we're both happy with the decisions we made, right? But uh, yeah, like, why do people still play 
I just want your opinion. I obviously have my opinion about that. Right. And I'm going to share that in a minute. But, you know, because, for example, recently we had uh, a scandal where at the very high stakes in poker, in No Limit Hold'em um, multiplayer game, um, one or a group of people used real-time assistance to beat those games with a high win rate. So the toughest games in the world, and they did it with real-time assistance. That made the news... That made a bit of a scandal. These games keep running. Why do you think that is? So there is a number of factors. Obvious one for many, it's exciting, it's gambling, you are well entertained, right? It's it's a fun activity. Some people are just grinders, they go, it's like a job, they they do it so many hours, they don't do crazy things, they make certain amount of money per hour, it's a job. Some people clean toilets, some grind at poker tables. It's a job, you need to make money. Super successful people, the really top players, they in it because they're winning. Money is amazing. Advertisement deals. I, I can totally see why someone would do that. For me, in addition to concern about uh, just the field being fully automated, when I advise students, I tell them, before you pick your major in college, make sure this job will exist by the time you graduate. A lot of accountants, tax attorneys will, will, will need less of them, let's put it this way. Uh, most important thing looking back, I would say, is meaning. I look back and I go, what have I accomplished in the last 12 years? I want some hands of poker. Is the world a better place? Is anyone happy about it except me? What if variance was not on my side and much higher? How happy would I be year to year being down 40% this year, 10% up next year, just standard variance. Mm. So for me, that's that's the questions one would have to go through to, to kind of make those decisions. Mm -hmm. Especially if it's a full-time thing. If you're doing it kind of part-time as fun hobby, that's a different animal. Everyone has hobbies. But if your whole identity, your whole life is, I'm a poker player, then some of those questions become important. Mm -hmm. oh, I completely agree with you. I think one of the questions that really should be on the forefront is why exactly like why do you like the game right because oftentimes if the answer is for the money because i'm winning that's usually a bad answer because well there's easier ways to to make money and maybe make money in a more sustainable long-term um, way but oftentimes for myself and for a lot of other people that i know that the the answer is the intellectual challenge to improve and mostly improve against yourself to be a better player and grow not only as a you know theoretical understanding of the game which is vastly complex and you know you can go into deep rabbit holes studying and trying to eke out and make sense of the numbers so to say and and, and find the concepts but also like what it teaches to you on a personal level you know how how it grows your character of you know trying to live with the variance basically you know understanding uh, the, the role of chance in life and being fine with it and moving on and you know winning and losing and winning and losing yet showing up for work and doing the doing the work not dwelling on the fact that oh something is unfair etc cetera, etc cetera. and I feel like you know this is a, a nice discipline to sort of mold your character in a way which is helpful uh, in the long term whatever other pursuits in life you would take right and that's obviously idealistic it's not every successful or unsuccessful poker player thinks in these terms and some people are clearly clearly in the wrong career and for some poker was clearly the right decision but that applies to every endeavor in life. You know, some people shouldn't be accountants, some people shouldn't be doctors, but uh, here there are. And one thing that you've just mentioned, which strikes me as very interesting, you know, now that we're talking about poker and the risk of AI killing the game, 
that same risk is in so many other careers. Like you said, the accountants, the lawyers should start getting a tiny bit worried that, listen, I might be redundant because there's a machine that can do my job uh, just as good as I do. How do you feel about it? You're researching AI. How do you feel about it? Like, don't you feel a bit concerned for humans? So there are jobs which no human should ever be forced to do or be desperate enough to do. I'm quite happy with automation of those jobs, especially if that means the person gets other opportunities, they will do something more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Now, if we truly succeed and we get to human level performance and above human level performance, it uh, challenges uh, fundamentally who we are. What is the purpose? Why, if we have nothing to contribute to super intelligent system, mm -hmm. like you talked about self-improvement and you're getting better, but how would you feel if you knew that the dumbest calculator is a billion times better poker player and no matter how hard you work, you are not competitive? That's kind of a downer and think about same in literature and arts and anything humans consider fundamental to, to what we are, that, that changes a lot. It's not just economic uh, difference we can solve it with uh, unconditional basic income and things like that. But in terms of meaning, that's uh, very, very disappointing to a lot of people to realize that uh, they are no longer producing good work compared to what even a dumb machine can do. Mm. What is good work, though? Because if we measure, for example, you know, the, the dumbest machine can make a calculation, for example, right? Much better than a human, but it can't explain the findings. Yet a human might get a thereabouts calculation, which is off by a few percent or whatever measure we take yet is going to be able to explain and illustrate something useful about the concept. Is, how do we think about that? So explainability is one of the areas I'm looking at, specifically with uh, deep neural networks. Uh, it's a well-known problem. They make excellent decisions, but uh, they're not very good at explaining how they arrive at them. Mm -hmm. And even if they are, we are not smart enough to understand the explanation in many cases. It's just too complex. Not surprisingly, deep neural networks are based on ideas we learn from neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Human brain is done the same way. And we're also not very good at explaining how we make decisions. If you ask me, how do you recognize faces? I cannot give you an algorithm. I cannot say, well, first I look whatever they have hair or not, if it's right hair. There is no such thing. I cannot explain how I do most of my decision making. So saying that it's only a limitation for AI, that's not fair. We are in the same boat. And then we do experiments on split brain patients. We learn that it's even worse. Half the time we make up explanations for why we do something after the fact. So mm -hmm. now that we are successful poker players, professors, we just make up stories for why we made that decision. At the time, it was like completely different and nothing to do with reality. Mm. Yeah, that example of faces is, is interesting because we in general find faces everywhere. Some people see Jesus on a piece of toast. And uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, but hmm, I don't know how to phrase it, but because um, you see that the thing about explainability, um, I remember there was a study I read about a couple of years ago. I think um, the name of the author was Caruana. I remember because the same as a chess player. Uh, he made a study about um, recognizing some sort of disease uh, that had to do with breathing problems on, uh, let's say, an x-ray. 
right? I'm just making a lot of assumptions, probably jumping from, you know, what was the real source. But anyway, so what he did, he uh, made an algorithm, a, a neural network, a machine learning algorithm that basically was with huge precision determining uh, which patients have a problem, which don't, and the severity of the problem, right? And so he kind of impressed the medical community and at the same time highly advised them not to use the algorithm. And his reasoning was that because he can't explain what it's doing, it's too risky to use it because, for example, they found one way uh, how it was making something that didn't make sense. For the asthma patients, it said, well, they're not in a high-risk group because they're fine for whatever reasons. And the real reasons were because in the real world, as soon as the asthma patient goes uh, you know, with the symptoms of pneumonia, for example, he gets immediate treatment because he's a very high risk. So the success rate for their recovery is much higher, right? And obviously the researcher said that, of course I can account and tweak the algorithm to deal with this problem. But then the question is what other unknowns unknowns are there? Right? I can't try to pretend to tweak every single thing. So where do we draw the line? Where is it okay to give full trust to the algorithm, even though we can't explain it, and when we should be wary of that? And probably that's where the, the security question comes, comes in as well. Right. Uh, it's a well-known study, and there are many similar ones. There is this whole dark dark space of patterns we don't know about which machines use to to make excellent predictions which if we understood how they make them we would be very disappointed in what they are doing it's especially showing up in all sorts of um, race gender contexts uh, with uh, biased algorithms but uh, the question i think you're asking is is there such a thing as 100 percent safe and secure software and the answer is no. All of them have bugs. And the question is, how much resources are we willing to allocate to substantially reduce the chance of one of those bugs? And it's kind of exponential. The more you put in, the closer you get, but you never get perfection. Mm -hmm. And depending on how impactful the system is, it may never be safe to release it. A system which can, as one of its decisions, destroy humanity. I don't care how many 9999 percentage points you give me, I don't feel comfortable. If it's making billions of decisions a second, one in a trillion is a mistake. It's a question of a few minutes and uh, we're done. Mm -hmm. it was, I recently read a book, uh, the new book of Malcolm Gladwell, uh, which is called Talking with Strangers or Talking to Strangers. I don't really remember the title. Wonderful book. And in, in the book, he mentioned an example of judges making the decisions about who to release on parole and who not to release. Make the sure algorithms... they get lunch. I'm sorry? Make sure they get lunch before they make decisions. Yeah, yeah that's one of, one of the things that uh, uh, definitely plays a role. But obviously, the algorithms have much higher precision in predicting whether... Uh, it's safe to release a person or not on parole, right? They, they had a very high accuracy in determining whether this person will go out and commit another crime. Whereas judges were not doing that good. And at the same time, judges insist in seeing the person face to face and actually seeing the face. As in, you know, if, if you're a Muslim woman, you are obliged to, uh, to lift the... The, the face uh, cover and, you know, reveal yourself. Because we as humans, we feel like, you know, if I look at you, I can learn something about you. I know more. We believe that we can sort of, from the visual interaction between people, we get so much information out of there. And that's something that the algorithm will never figure out. The reality shows that the algorithm is much more accurate because it doesn't have the noise of perceptions, et cetera, et cetera. So the algorithm is going to be always way more accurate. But on, on an emotional level, we feel uncomfortable with an idea because you feel like, yeah, but all my life I've been looking people in the eye and, and, and thinking that I can understand what they're about. 
So how is it going to be a problem for for us when more and more things are automated and more and more trust is in the algorithms where we're going to feel some sort of identity crisis maybe of like what does it mean to be human for sure and also if you trust the system religiously you don't get an explanation you know it's super accurate this is a religious experience god said do it this way and we have to do it Mm -hmm. and you don't know if somebody hacked the system or a programmer has a back door and now somebody controls god from behind the scenes so it creates so many problems. And the example you use predicting who's going to reoffend, you may have a very accurate system, but it may be very dangerous in terms of properties I mentioned. So mm-hmm. people would not accept it regardless. Oh, you have a racist AI judging us, uh, it's terrible. So all these questions are not answered either in computer science or engineering. We can code in whatever you want, right? You tell us you want this percentage, we can code it in. But somebody in social sciences, philosophy, needs to explain what the good is, what the right answers are. How do we understand what good is, what intelligence is? Because in general, like it seems like we are trying to reach human level intelligence. Is human level intelligence really? A goal here? Why do we put ourselves front and center? Maybe our intelligence is not as incredible as we'd like to believe. We see human intelligence as a definite working example of general intelligence. Now, Mm -hmm. in reality, everyone tries to do better and have lower error rates than humans. So, super intelligence is a true goal. But we want generality of a human. And even within that, humans are not a general intelligence. There are many problems where we don't do well. But the concept of a system, same system, being able to learn in multiple domains, transfer knowledge, that's the holy grail. That's what we want. Once we get there, we can quickly build up to better. Mm -hmm. So for intelligence to be general, what do we believe it needs to be able to do? Does it need to be able to process visual information, audible information, or does it not matter? It's all about making decisions or it's all about winning. As Any you information, said. whatever inputs, if you have an infrared sensor, that's what you're using. If you're getting a radio signal, it doesn't matter. There are zeros and ones. Mm-hmm. What they map onto is irrelevant. You can process that stream, extract a meaningful pattern, predict future states, make appropriate bets, win. Mm. So give me an example. When could we say that, okay, this is general, uh, this is human level intelligence. Like what would be the test, so to say, to, to call something a human intelligence? I assume you don't want me to mention Turing test. You want well, I can, you can mention the Turing test, but is it, that's it? Is that the, the only thing? It is hated by many people, but if you realize that you can encode any type of question as a question for a Turing test, whatever it's about engineering, art, anything else, it's actually a very meaningful test. Mm -hmm. If something is as good as human at anything you try, it's hard for you to argue that, no, it's actually inferior. Right. But does the Turing test not uh, entail that if conversing with an intelligence, you can't tell whether it's human or otherwise, then you pass the test. So it sort of zooms in on just the conversation. In that case, maybe a version of uh, GPL is going to somehow reach that intelligence or, or you know, at least pass the test occasionally. Whereas, is it really on the path for general intelligence? And that's what I'm saying. You can encode any type of problem as a question in text, right? You mm-hmm. can ask them about a chess position. You can ask them to solve a math puzzle. So if they do well in all those other domains, what is the issue? Because that, that sort of feels one-dimensional to me, that it's just an intelligence that can converse. Does it mean that it can make decisions? Does it mean that it can... Uh... Ask it. Ask it to make a decision. See if it makes a decision as well as a human. Okay. Place it in the same situation. Again, you can take any domain you actually care about and reduce it to text interface. Mm-hmm. 
interesting. What is the role of art in intelligence? Because we humans are, you know, that this idea of aesthetics, the idea of beauty that is quite close to us. Is it also down to zeros and ones? So there is a difference between making art and perceiving art. Then a human makes art, supposedly, if it's not modern art, they actually put something into it, right? They don't just spill paint. They, they have some emotional state, which they're trying to project. Uh, machines can produce art, in fact, produce it better by brute forcing the space of possible arts, but they don't put anything into it. They just optimize for most impressive picture or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Then you receive art as a human, you look at a piece of art and maybe you capture same emotions as the artist. Maybe you, everyone captures a different set of emotions, but it's emotional. It makes you feel and think. So that's what we consider good art. Mm -hmm. People say, well, since machines produce art without feeling, it's garbage, it's not real art. But again, we have Turing tests like the main specific studies where poems, music and art do produce emotional response in humans, even if produced by machines. And we can tell. You listen to this classical piece and it's beautiful. You're happy. Machine wrote it. Mm -hmm. Is it art? Is it music? But what of perception of art? Is it important for intelligence to perceive art? Because can a computer perceive art? Can it have emotions? Are emotions part of what it takes to be human intelligence. It can tell you what emotions a human would likely have looking at that piece. It doesn't have its own internal conscious states that we can test for. Mm -hmm. There is some arguments that if a system is complex enough, advanced enough, it starts having those internal states, qualia, illusions like humans do. I have a paper on that topic, and I think that's very likely, at least some rudimentary internal states, but that's not something we can test. Uh, you can do a multiple choice test and kind of go, well, do you experience this as pleasant, unpleasant, whatnot, and then compare results with a human. So you can say that the system gets similar response rates, but you never know if it's feeling it the same way we do. But it's true about humans. I don't know if you feel pain the same way I do. Wow. I, um, the more we talk, the more kind of speechless I am and in awe of, of what's going on. Because it, it really... I'm the, passing the Turing test, right? I can tell my AI is doing really well. Yes, it's definitely, you know, the, the, that giveaway is all your babies up there on the shelf. But uh, Deep yeah. fakes. They're fakes, deep fakes, yeah. Interesting, because, yeah, the creation of art and the perception of art and the emotions feels like such a human way to think about AI, because we want to sort of see the intelligence from our perspective, like something created in our um image so to say like to take a phrase from a bible right because we basically want to like call something our level of intelligence if it also can feel if it also has remorse if it has the understanding of good and bad but then if one one once we start scratching the surface we realize well we, we can't tell what we actually think or feel how do we compare like you said like how do we know that the the level of pain that you feel is the same that I feel in the same situation under the same circumstances. Like, how do we measure these things? And when somebody tells you they feel deep emotions of love or of hate, how do we know whether they really feel it or they made themselves believe that they feel it? And it's like oh, the just lying to you to oh, exactly to yeah. something. Yeah, exactly. And can we even like can a human? understand an intelligence that is beyond us how would we ever be able to understand it if it's higher level of intelligence so that's the comprehensibility of ai 
a complement of explainability. Even if a system gives an honest, deep explanation of what it's doing, it may be too large, too complex for us to understand. Think about parents and children communicating, young children. Most of the time, you don't give them an actual explanation. You give them a simplified or a complete lie. Where do babies come from? Oh, we bought you at a store. Okay, so you get some information, but that's what we're going to get. We cannot get a complete picture with thousands of features and weights, so we get top 10 explanation why you got denied this loan. And mm-hmm. the more complex the system is, the less we're going to be able to fully engage with it. Uh, questions about art are great, and they're always very meaningful, but whatever we decide, the safety and security aspects of those systems are still the same. We're still creating a very capable optimizer. Whatever it understands art or not, it can still kill you. It can still ruin your economy. It can still do problems in terms of privacy, democracy. So uh, it's important to concentrate on very specific properties of those systems. Uh, They're not all equal. Mm -hmm. And what's your take on, for example, the recommendation algorithms right because we see currently that you know the algorithms from twitter from facebook from pinterest from you name it from all of those sources pretty much divide the society in a way Mm -hmm. especially acutely felt in united states right now because you know if you go into one rabbit hole you seem to go deeper and deeper and deeper because all the information you're getting is exactly about that one thing and then the other group of people are getting exactly the opposite information. And so the question is like, what is true? What is the understanding of truth, et cetera, et cetera. But to just, how do you feel about this? Like, is it out of control right now, these uh, algorithms? You still have a lot of control in what you do. So the algorithms will reinforce whatever you give them as a starting point. If you say, I like X, you're going to see double X, triple X, you're going to go in that direction. But then you like something. You have an option to like the opposite. I like Pepsi, I like Coke. You can explicitly seek out diverse sources of information. So Facebook algorithm is very confused because every time I like something, I go and like the opposite and like completely unrelated thing. And they just, they can't figure out what is wrong with me. Many things, but... It really helps you. If you realize, uh, take politics, for example, right? We have people who don't know anyone out of thousands of friends who votes for the other guy. Think about that. You should know half the people. That's the statistical distribution, right? All our elections are 50-50, give or take. So if you don't, you placed yourself in that position where algorithm thinks you only like this. You have to work hard, go like the other guy, follow the other guy. Hmm. But don't we, if we start living in the illusion of we're making the choices, but those choices are spoon fed to us, how can we sort of say, okay, enough of that. I'm going to seek out the opposite opinion just to kind of calibrate back to reality. Isn't it it's a great question. Hard. It creates this false illusion of binary. There is only two choices. And of course, what they do, they set up two almost identical choices and ignore reality. So you have to work very hard to jump out of the box and find, oh, there is a third option and a fourth option. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of work. Nobody's going to do it for you. Do you think human society is actually prepared to deal with the technology right now because we don't talk about it in school i mean by the when we were in school these things were still not even anywhere near but it seems like you know especially the social media and uh, all of those things are such a big part of most of our lives most everybody has some sort of presence on the internet even if it's just down to googling st- stuff and you still get uh, recommendations Yet we are not educated as to what to do about it. 
right? Because your idea, for example, whenever you click like on something, you should seek out the opposite, click like just to kind of calibrate. That's not an idea a lot of people have. I know I don't do it, although I don't go and end up in the rabbit hole of the earth is flat or whatever other reinforced uh, crap. But, you know, a lot of people do end up there. So nobody can teach you those things because nobody really knows. They're running experiments right now on us. When they release a new Facebook feature, they have no idea what it's actually going to do. They did a small trial, but they get surprised just like we do. They don't think anyone will use that feature that way, and then people do it. And so, no, you can't teach kids in school right now about how it's going to be in 12 years with technology. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. And uh, you have to kind of work very hard to avoid whatever it's um, reinforcement algorithms forcing you to stay with the app for hours or rabbit holes or bubbles, all of those things. You can recognize them as problematic and work explicitly to overcome them. Mm. Seriously, like a simple thing. If you're in a bubble right now, like look around. If everyone agrees with you, nobody ever says opposite opinion just on purpose go to the person you hate the most and like them and their friends mm. that that's gonna take uh, <laughs> some courage yes but, yeah. that's the only way you you learn to learn you mm. need positive examples and negative examples if you're only training on positive examples you will never learn to distribute mm -hmm. Isn't it worrying you that in a modern age where it seems like there's abundance of information, abundance of good information, we have such a huge percentage of people who believe the earth is flat? Abundance of information is not a good thing. It's a paradox of choice. When you had one book to read, that was easy. You read the book, you knew the book. Now you have a billion books to read. You have time to read one. Choose carefully. Mm -hmm. So you're in a much harder situation. It's harder to keep up. It's harder to know who's really an expert. And the experts are in the same position. Then I started doing work in AI safety. I could literally read every paper in the field. Mm -hmm. Today, every day, there is more papers than I can read in a year. So every day I become less and less of an expert in my own field, despite working harder. Mm -hmm. We used to live in the same street read the same books, saw the same TV show. Now there is a hundred channels, a billion books. We no longer have the same informational individual bubbles. So we grow separate. And as you said, it uh, kind of reinforces you to go deeper and deeper in some directions. I frequently give a talk to a conference of business executives. I ask them, well, let's say there is a hundred people. How many of you heard about Bitcoin? maybe one hand. How many of you heard about superintelligence? Zero hands. So those are top-notch people, smart, educated, wealthy, but their bubble and my bubble have nothing in common. So it's not a question of, oh, those dumb people, flat earth. In general, we don't have a good way to filter out information which is important. Mm -hmm. And we hope that AI will solve that problem for us. But of course, it will just create a different type of filtering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see, because my, my concern with the flat earth thing is not so much that, oh, these dumb people. My concern is that there is a lot of on the surface smart people who believe that crap. And at the same time, you would think like, but how can you? Like, there's so much information out there. It just even seems like common sense would disprove that. But what concerns me about it is when I see huge amounts of people believing that thing, which is clearly irrational and it just doesn't like seems like they're lacking the logic. I'm concerned. Do I have beliefs like this as well, which are completely reinforced and completely erroneous? And somebody else from outside would say, dude, like, didn't you like, don't you can't, can't you think like what what do you believe? Not from outside, but from the future. If you look at the history, we always believed the wrong things. And the next generation went, I can't believe they did that. Mm -hmm. Violent idiots. And it's going to continue in the same way. But what we do is we try to block this information. Let's block flat earth theory from Facebook. 
That's exactly the wrong way to do it. Expose it, study it, understand what is the logical error they are committing so you don't repeat it. Mm -hmm. If you never actually looked at this or any other conspiracy theory, that's a great source of negative data. You wouldn't train your algorithm just on good scientific theories. You want to train them on, this is a bad scientific theory. This is a good one. This is how you tell. Mm -hmm. Can the algorithm tell that that's a bad theory? What what are the parameters? And and also, like you said, we we can see it from the future. I think if we look back 400 years ago, we would say, oh, these people believe the earth is flat. And then now fast forward to modern age and there's again a huge amount of people believing the same thing. So we have 8 billion people. No matter what, you can find some subset who believe in anything. It doesn't matter how insane there is a small group. It's a lot of people. Majority of scientists do not, so it's what we really care about. Does the scientific community get this one right or not? Now, some problems are more contentious. Even scientists disagree. We don't have agreement on cosmology and quantum physics and all sorts of things. So you want to learn from terrible examples to spot out these problems and hopefully be able to do better as a result. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, if you actually looked at the flat earthers, did you see an obvious thing they all overlook or discount? Or what is the main arc? Like, I can't say I spend a lot of time on that particular one, but is there something obvious to you other than you know the right answer? Well, I haven't looked at it in, into it deeply as well because I, I feel like maybe I have better flat. uses for my time. Maybe to go and look at it. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe. And I'm not even going to publish this uh, this podcast. I'm going to be like, guys, you know, I should spread flat. the word. I should spread the word. You're, you're missing out. True, I haven't looked at it. at, And it would be interesting because, as you said, it would be interesting to figure out like how, why would they believe that, right? Because that is definitely interesting like why why do you think so but then again like i probably have better uses for for my time than that but yeah but it would be very interesting to study because we see the glaring edge cases sort of because they are just such outliers and in your face but there must be millions of false beliefs that everybody is sort of trained to just because of you know, going into these little rabbit holes or, or being in these little bubbles where you don't see that there's another opinion, you know, especially this election in the United States probably shows it acutely when it, some of the Democrats can't find any explanation. Like how would these Republicans think the way they do? Are they crazy? And vice versa. It yeah. can't be that both of them are right. It can't be that only one of them are right and the other one is. So there must be some middle ground, but you know, we, we sort of fall, fall further and further apart from trying to find the middle ground. I think physics uh, has a lot of good answers for politics. So in physics, you understand that it is relative to the observer. You don't expect mm -hmm. same speed or same order of events for different observers. It's the same in politics, depending on where you are in the position in life, you'd have different, sometimes opposite preferences. But people standing next to someone with the same observer point going, oh, they're crazy, look, they, they can't tell the obvious facts. We'll just trade places and you'll see the same thing for both sides. Mm -hmm. And Roman, I wanna circle back to the question of AI security, right? Because you've mentioned the obvious example, which is we need, like if a machine can destroy the world, we need a kill switch or we probably don't need to re release it. It's too much of a risk. What of these, for example, the recommendation algorithms, do they need some safety as well? Just because it seems like, like when do we know that we need to be concerned with the algorithm? Is it the, the question of the domain that the algorithm is operating on? Or is it the question of, like, what is the question? Because like, nobody could have predicted what effect these uh, recommendation engines are going to have. And yet now we see uh, that some things seem to be a bit out of control. 
Right. So dangers are proportionate to what the algorithm is capable of doing in a domain. So a simple recommender system for a movie. If it screws up, it recommends a really bad movie and ruins your night. That's not good. It's not destroying the world, but in proportion to what it's designed to do, it failed. Mm-hmm. If it's uh, recommending foods, maybe you have an allergy. Now you got peanuts in your candy, you're going to die from it. So that's much bigger problem, but still one person. Scale it proportionally. You have a system controlling stock market for the whole world, nuclear response, uh, very big impact if it's making a mistake. So you always have to worry, but the resources for testing and debugging should be proportionate to negative outcome. Mm. But if we think about these things in terms of reinforcement, right? They reinforce the behavior. If you click a like, they're going to give you more and more of the same option, right? What if the movie recommending engine all of a sudden, you know, fast forward three years from now and you are a white supremacist convinced that, uh, you know, whatever false beliefs that you might have just because all the movies that you watched for the last three years are in the same direction. And I don't think it's even such a crazy example. These, these things are already happening in a way that, you know, just because we go into the rabbit holes of following the recommendation, getting more and more information on the same reinforcing idea. Isn't so that that's a the concept of propaganda, right? Governments always try doing it. They keep showing you movie with how great the leader is until you love the leader. It's, we're mm-hmm. just doing it more efficiently now, but it's not new. But isn't it worrying when it's not even, like nobody's even in control? It would be worrying if somebody was in control because then, again, too much power for the government and it's a propaganda dream machine. We're still in control today. That's why it's so important to realize those things now. We will not be in control once the machines are smarter. Today, we still decide what the algorithm is showing you. We are in control, the big way, humans. Mm -hmm. Are we? Are we really? Well, Facebook can decide to show you any recommendations they want, right? Do we need regulation for them? Because it seems like they're not really incentivized to control things because the the money incentive is there. So the we're more... having hearings today in the Senate with Facebook, Twitter, Google, CEOs, exactly about this topic, so it's very relevant. It's wonderful to have those regulations. Now, who's deciding on what the right answers are? Who's going to tell them what to show? Mm-hmm. You're just transferring the problem one level up. Mm. Yeah, it's sort of the same thing of, you know, the judge insisting to see the person because he believes that he is going to make a much more educated choice because he can see the soul of the person. I think the classic uh, is who verifies the verifiers, who watches the watchers. Mm -hmm. Wow. So are we just going to a place where these decisions are going to be just delegated? to some sort of intelligence that we created? Some sort if of If it's verifier? actually smarter than us, eventually it will do most decision-making and we won't be able to turn it off or undo that decision. So we're hitting very close to point of no return, in my opinion, and most people don't even realize there is a problem. Hmm. sounds pretty scary to me because if all of a sudden you realize well you know what it's not up to you the machine says the computer says no so you're not gonna it's okay so what's my place am i like a domesticated animal right now basically living in a in the cage of you know like a pavlov's dog somebody rings a bell the machine says you need to eat Uh, okay open your mouth let's chew Notification icon comes up. Exactly. Yeah. At lunchtime, you're eating uh, porridge for, for breakfast. Okay. Seems pretty scary and definitely problematic for, as a human, to just think like, okay, what's my place in this world if I can't even make decisions for myself because a machine is doing them better? 
I mean, the goal is not to just sound scary, but to make people realize the reality of this technology and have an informed decision. We, we as uh, researchers, as scientists, are funded in large part by government, by taxpayers, but taxpayers don't get any say in what they would like to see happen. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that there's a lot of studies right now in the field of uh, AI security and AI safety compared mm-hmm. to, to uh, some years ago. Now there's more and more work. Where is the consensus going? What is the general uh, direction of the work at the moment in the field? So I would say majority believe the problem is solvable. The solution is to teach machine to want what humans want, the value alignment problem, where through whatever means you try to understand through wants of humans, not just through surveys, but what we actually want because we lie on surveys. And so then the machines will be designed to want the same thing, update as we update, and uh, kind of keep that value function unchanged even as they get more capable. Mm-hmm. That's what majority of the field currently sees as happening. But how would we know what do humans want? So that's where people propose different ideas. Some are more workable than others. Uh, I can give you a bunch of different examples and you can decide for yourself if they make sense to you. So you can uh, make AI read lots of good literature and learn from books uh, about what to do. Uh, You can watch Facebook feeds and Twitter comments. You can do some neuro scans and try to understand human brains at that level. Um, lots of sources of data, YouTube videos. Hmm. It sounds really scary to me. I don't know, maybe it doesn't sound scary to you. To me, it sounds scary. Like everything that has to do with let's learn from, from books, Facebook, or movies. We are so susceptible to reinforcing you know, because for for example, for humans, the way I understand it, and I might be obviously wrong uh, completely about this, but for example, the flat earthers or any radical beliefs or any conspiracy theories which are fueled by reinforcement is because we have strong responses to that type of information, emotional responses. When something makes you angry or outraged. If you're in the state of mind that you're still outraged, you're going to keep watching the outraged things. You know, If you're watching something funny, you're unlikely to switch to, to watch uh, a documentary about Holocaust. Right? You're going to keep watching your funny things. We're reinforcing ourselves in, in that way. So if we are looking at human beha- behavior, like what do people want? Isn't there a risk that you know, we could just see, oh, people want to be outraged because this is the fuel. This is just incredible. You know, create conflict, create something that we elicit a lot of emotions. Like how do we tell these emotions are good and you should feel that way? And these emotions, these are the bad ones. Please don't feel like what this way and please uh, don't watch this crap. Because again... Very, very difficult problem. How do you get... First of all, multiple people to agree, right? We've been Mm. trying it with philosophy, ethics for millennia. We don't agree on anything. So not only do you have to value align with individual human preferences, you have to scale it to at least 8 billion people, then maybe animals and aliens and other AIs. And uh, we change what we want. You give me everything I asked for and I'm going to complain. That's not what I ordered. Mm -hmm. You know, I wanted something else. Our values change. If we are smarter and have better assistance, what I want is completely different than what I wanted when I was dumber. So I see a lot of unsolved, unsolvable, impossible modules in that solution. And that's my latest research. I'm trying to show that you can't predict what this super intelligence system will do. You cannot explain it. You cannot comprehend it. You cannot control it. You cannot communicate with it without ambiguity. You cannot uh, properly monitor it. So that's that's the whole set of problems I'm looking at right now. 
And it seems that you can get partial improvements, partial solutions with more resources, which is great. We want safer AI, but it seems that you can never get to completely 100% safe. And Mm -hmm. for this particular domain of global decision-making, that seems important. In standard cybersecurity, okay, you screwed up, somebody steals a credit card, it gets canceled, nobody died. You get a second chance, your bank still operates. Whereas here, it could be a fatal flaw you cannot Mm -hmm. recover from. And also just thinking about this notion of knowing what people want or need. If we think about the example of the world we're living in right now, you know, and I don't know how is your local situation where I'm here, we don't have strict restrictions just yet, but everybody's wearing a mask, you know, obviously travel restricted, this restricted, et cetera, et cetera, was unimaginable, let's say a year ago. You would tell somebody, or you would make a movie about exactly the world that we live right now, People would watch it and say, yeah, this is, nah, this is bullshit. This is not happening, right? And the values change that what we want, what exactly matters, what doesn't matter, kind of changed really quickly for a lot of people. Some people are more outraged about you know, the, the, the values of staying together, going through this together. That's really important. Some people are going in the opposite direction. Individual values are really important. So we divide on every aspect like that. So do we even know ourselves? what we want individually and on a collective um, basis? No, because a lot of times what we say they want, we later discover that that's not making us happy. So every every year we have undergraduates change their major, change it again. They realize they don't want to be in college. So even those somewhat easy decisions are puzzling. And if it's more complex, we have no idea what we want. Mm. Do we want the machine to tell us what we want? Or it's a really scary notion. So it's nice to have a very smart assistant. Like with poker, we talked about instantaneous, uh, this is the right decision. And then you kind of get to decide what to do with it. That seems beneficial in many situations. But it very quickly becomes, well, the system is always right. I do what it says anyways. Why am I here? Let's just connect. The system's going to place the bet. I'm making money. I don't have to think. And at that point, you took yourself out of the equation. You no longer contribute anything to it. And you obviously also killed the domain because as soon as that's a common thing, the whole notion of poker in that example, it loses sense. Like why, why would you, first of all, why would a human play in a place where he clearly has no chance and why would machines play against each other? Because who, who's really winning? What's it for? Well, humans still go to casinos where they have no chance. So that wouldn't stop them. Right. That's true. AIs would be interested in competing, dominating, learning better strategies like you described yourself. So they can still, if they have a goal of becoming dominant AI player, a dominant poker player, they can continue playing against other bots. We're just kind of taking humans out of the equation, but a lot of the mm-hmm. same uh, motivations may remain. Would a bot really be motivated by achievement? It's how you program it. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, I guess. It's a funny notion of uh, you know a ring of bots fighting against each other, trying to prove who's the daddy of the bots. That's... Uh, that's interesting. How far are we? Because you're describing a world which is borderline scary, where we would have an intelligence that we can't explain, we can't understand, and which seems superior in some aspects and making better decisions, so should theoretically have control over what's going on in the world. How far are we from that being a possibility and how prepared are we to make sure that we account for the risks, that we put in the fail-safes, that we consider the security and safety implications? So nobody knows for sure how long it will take. I heard estimates as low as seven years. Some people say never. 
So it's somewhere in between, seven, never. Uh, 2045 is the year a lot of people mention based on different uh, growth rates and uh, computing power and other data availability. Uh, it really doesn't matter. The same problems remain. And as of today, no one has a working safety mechanism capable of scaling. So the more time we get, the better it is. We should start working on it yesterday. And uh, I hope I'm wrong and it's a solvable problem. Mm. If I'm right, then we have a different set of issues to deal with. Mm. For example, this projection of 2045, I assume that implies no major leaps in computing technology in a sense that we're not going to all of a sudden have quantum computing and it somehow is going to be a game changer. We're talking about incremental improvements on the existing ideas and in existing uh, technology. Is that is that right? Or are we hoping for some sort of breakthrough somewhere? Usually how those charts are made, they look at data in computing improvements since 1800s. So you mm -hmm. had mechanical computers, vacuum tubes. And so whatever next paradigm after what we use today is quantum DNA doesn't matter. That's the rate of growth. This is where we hit parity with human brain. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden tomorrow we have a big government project, we put $2 trillion in developing faster compute, it will speed up things, yes. But it's like big O notation. It doesn't matter if we a year here, a year there, it's a constant. Mm -hmm. And are we sure that we know the path? Are we sure that the current approach, for example, the deep neural networks, the machine learning, that's the way to achieve or simulate the brain, basically? We're not sure. Nobody knows. But it looks like, at least right now, that we're making good progress. And every time we add more compute and more data, it gets better. It doesn't flatten. It doesn't get worse. So we're still not at the level of human brain. And if we keep growing, at least we know we, we're making more capable systems. Mm -hmm. It's possible we'll hit a bottleneck, the system can never do something, we need a different approach. Completely possible. But I would be surprised. It seems we copied enough of a human brain where we're getting same results, we're even getting same errors and same optical illusions. So it seems like it's a pretty good copy, and we just keep scaling it to human level. Can you give me a bit more about the optical illusions? That sounds like a very interesting Right, so thing. illusions, any type of illusion, audio illusion, optical illusion, is some sort of an error in how you perceive your environment based on your hardware, your algorithms, and the input. If you see a cool optical illusion, you look at it and it starts rotating, for example. Without being programmed, deep neural networks experience similar mistakes and similar inputs. Nobody explicitly taught them to see illusions, but in doing, let's say, visual pattern recognition, they end up mm -hmm. making the same type of mistake. So to me, it's additional evidence that it's a legitimate copy. Right, right. And that also comes back to the question of perception of art, right? If a computer can perceive an illusion, so let's say we have some sort of drawing, which, you know, if you look at it from one angle or just, you know, if you switch your focus, sort of, it's either start spinning or any sort of visual illusion. If computer can perceive that, then what's the stretch of imagination to say it perceives art? It might not experience the emotions that we're used to in our uh, understanding, but it might still perceive it and recognize it as art and maybe you know this art i like and this is this is not so great that that seems like a easy problem to me at least right if it says it likes all the art i mean okay so it likes it right it's kind of scary that you know a lot of the things that we consider makes us human are either down to zeros or ones or are just irrelevant yeah. Sounds about right. <laughs> Sounds about right. But that's the scary part, you know. <laughs> How can you be uh, so calm about it? That's uh, that's so interesting. Wow. You know what? 
I want to ask you a bit more about poker, coming back to it, because our initial conversation about it just scared the crap out of me. Because <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And we could go and I don't want to spend time with you on that and like going into why there's still a lot of hope for poker players and, and the industry, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's time for another conversation. I'm going to have another conversation with somebody else. I think your expertise is so interesting in understanding the bigger implications here of like what, what it's going to do to society, et cetera, et cetera. Because games, as you said, are the sandbox for the algorithms and for AI. Now, chess is a game of complete information. Poker is a game of incomplete information. So a lot of people, and I, I believe it was Turing himself who said that, or maybe I'm wrong, maybe it wasn't him, but one of the, those early geniuses in computer sciences said that poker is the most interesting game for computers to play in because because it's so vastly difficult and there it's not a far uh, leap of imagination to say that if you can solve poker and and be very advanced in that that imp, uh, that applications of that algorithm are are vast and and uh, you know they're everywhere what's your take on that is poker a special game as far as the sandboxes go I mean, it's a great example. It's a great uh, tool environment for testing and developing. Uh, it's very similar to business negotiations, very similar to a lot of other domains, uh, adversarial games. But we've seen AI beat human players, and we don't have AGI yet. So that's not sufficient to have general intelligence to be a good poker player. Historically, same thing was said about chess. It was said that we will first uh, have general intelligence. It will then complain that it doesn't want to play chess. It wants to write poetry, but that's the only way to get to world championship level. Mm -hmm. We developed chess computers without any general capabilities. So I don't think there is any specific narrow game which will guarantee that if you can do that, you can do anything else, unless you can encode other states in that game. So Turing test, you can see as a game. It's an adversarial game, you're trying to win, but I can encode chess, poker, anything else into it. Whereas uh, the games themselves are not very narrow, but they're not completely general either. So I would disagree with that uh, strong statement that once you have a good poker player, you solved AI. Mm. No, that's definitely not the case. But, you know, the nature of the game of incomplete information, the negotiation imitation sort of thing, it has um, applications in um, defense, in uh, you know, biomedicine, in uh, cybersecurity, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the chess engines or chess ais they are much more narrow focus much more narrow application although Absolutely. alpha zero clearly seems to be a very interesting project which uh, probably has a lot of uh, applications because we've seen the same alpha zero uh, beat go which was yeah. alpha go basically the same type of algorithm just starts beating all all those games which many of which we always thought like, well, it's going to take forever, if ever, to beat those. So it's a lot more general. It's not universal, but it's starting to show signs of generality. Absolutely. Yeah. What is your biggest concern currently working on these things? Like, what do you think are... Well, let's start with the scientific community. What are the biggest points that people are missing there? Well, again, it's a lot of bubbles. Some people don't even realize there is a problem. Others are highly skeptical that there is any AI risk whatsoever. Even top scholars, very respected scholars, it's all science fiction. There is nothing to worry about. Uh, 
anytime there is a difficulty. Okay, a robot cannot open a door handle. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. We are thousands of years away from AI. That's guarantee that we are safe. Uh, so even getting most people working on AI to understand that this is a serious problem and they need to take that into account while working on their projects, that's very important. Within safety community itself, you have a different bubble where I think there is almost universal agreement that the problem can be solved. It's a question of, you know, give us a little more money in a few more years and we'll get there. Even that is not obvious. And I don't think there is a significant amount of conversation about just how solvable it is. If even with small percentage probability, we take the possibility that it's not solvable, well, what is our plan B? If I have a solid verified proof that you cannot control higher level intelligence, what do we do now? As a government, uh, as scientists, at different levels, what's, what's our plan of action? Nobody has one. So I would like to see at least more conversation about those topics. This is why I do the interviews I do. I'm hoping that more people will get interested in having this conversation. It's a big question. What do we do if we prove it can't be solved? Because the same question that on a different scale, different, same, same, but different was the discussion about the atomic bomb. Do we create it? Do we, if we know it's going to, it has potential to destroy the world, do we go there? Do we not go there? How can we control, like if we as a government make a decision, we don't go there, how can we prevent others not to go there? And then it's again an arms race in terms of AI. Like it's hard to imagine how one government unilaterally would say, okay, we don't go there because it's, it's bad. And then it's hard to imagine all the governments coming together to an agreement. Okay, we, nobody goes there and honoring the agreement. Because it's a sort of prisoner's dilemma of do we trust that they're going to honor the agreement or are they actually secretly trying to gain the advantage. Right, and you're assuming that the problem is like Manhattan's project size problem, only a government can do it. What if you can do it on your laptop in a garage? Yeah, that's even scarier, because you can do it on your laptop in the garage and, and rent a server space somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't even know if the uh, difficulty of a problem is such that you cannot control it through mm. legislation, through government, even if governments agree, which is, as you said, very yeah. difficult. And, and even scarier is not only you can do it in the garage, you can be 15 years old and do it in your garage. You can do it by mistake. You don't realize that's, how that's it. Yeah. good you are. Yeah. Hmm. What do you think, like the general population, should think about these things? And what should they... First of all, think, and second, do. Because this is the world we live in, yet the conversation about um, AI and the dangers of AI is not a very popular conversation. Like you said, in the business conference, you, you would ask a group of 100 people, maybe one would, uh, or nobody would uh, say, yeah, I've heard the details about super intelligence. So it's a difficult question. We discussed how we can get people not to accept flat earth theory. Uh, it's much harder to convince them about dangers of future non-existing technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, my hope is that when people vote, they vote more for scientists and engineers, less for lawyers and politicians. In general, that's a good strategy. Uh, I'm not optimistic about that one either. Yeah, and even like, can't even solve the problem of the flat earth. I mean, to me, this is not solved right now. It clearly should be solvable because, as you said, uh, Facebook has enough of the power to pull the plug on the whole thing. 
But hiding it makes it worse. Now you're hiding the secret. It makes it juicier. Oh, the secret. Now, I think just yes. there's saying that knows, it's... A... Everyone wants to know the real information, real knowledge. Yeah. Evolutionary advantage is to know reality. If you think that whoever is hiding information from you, now you are more interested in pursuing it. So anytime they say, you are not allowed to talk about how lizard people or whatever. Everyone mm-hmm. wants to talk about lizard people, right? That is true. I'm sure we might even pop up as a recommendation in, <laughs> in some lizard people groups. As but uh, we'll get blocked by Facebook, so I suggest you cut out lizard people. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd prefer that they block us and all the other lizard people. That's that's fine. I, that's the cost I'm willing to pay. I hope they publicly block us and tell everyone not to watch this podcast. <laughs> yeah, that would be, be, that'd be the best the best thing for the podcast ever. But that's. See, the the whole problem, and I'm just scratching the surface here, and obviously I'm coming from a perspective of a lame, lame per, lay person here. <laughs> uh, lame person. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, the language not the strong part either. Of, uh, I need a software update here. But uh, to me, it seems like such a complex problem because it's so multidimensional because it's not only a technological problem it's not only a philosophical problem it's also when we talk about understanding or controlling or anything else when it comes to a different intelligence we can't even really understand or control ourselves individually or as a group So in some of my papers, I talk about reducing this control problem to a simpler uh, problem of uh, controlling a human, human safety. Mm -hmm. And you are correct. We failed at that. We tried ethics, morals, religion, lie detector tests. uh, Nothing works. You still get humans who betray you. You still don't have full control. So you can't have a safe human. (laughs) That's that's so beautiful. You can't have a safe human. That's true. We don't even really understand how our mind works, which is scary and, and nice at the same time. Would we lose the reverence for what it is to be human if we could uh, sort of put it down to zeros and, zeros and ones and we could say, well, you know, your your mind is not that beautiful we can just copy paste it put it somewhere else especially for religious people it would i think be a significant challenge to their faith if you think there is a soul there is a spiritual aspect to humanity to to show that it's not necessary would would make should make a difference Hmm. yeah wow because what, where are we going with this, really? Because from one perspective, AI brings us so much positive. And like you said, there are some jobs that people should not have to do. Some jobs need to be automated. Some jobs need to be just a machine running these things. The world would be a better, safer place in many regards if some things were just taken care of by an algorithm, right? And that would free people up to do a more meaningful and more fulfilling job, or maybe, I don't even know if, is it something we need to do? Do people need to work? Like, what is what is the meaning of, like, why are we here? What are we supposed to do? That may be a bit above my pay grade. It seems that people who do have some meaning are happier, but uh, what is the ultimate goal of life is uh, is a hard question. It's interesting we can map this discussion back into the poker world. So if you are a poker player developing an advanced poker bot, if you succeed, you're essentially killing your game, right? Mm-hmm. So it's exactly the same scenario. It's helpful, it's useful, it helps you analyze games, it uh, helps you win money, but the moment you hit your goal, you lose. Yeah, that is exactly right. The moment you hit the goal, you lose because you kill the domain. 
What is your biggest fear in terms of what can happen in you know the the near future? Let's not talk about twenty forty five. So insider threat, where you have unsafe humans on purpose designing malevolent systems, seems to be as strictly the worst problem. Because in addition to all the issues we discussed, you can have any type of malicious payload added to it. There is some research on uh, not just existential risks, but suffering risks, uh, meaning maximizing pain and suffering which uh, sounds weird, but uh, that's what terrorists do, right? Hmm. That now you scared me completely because, you know, obviously before we were just talking about the inherent risks of the systems itself and yeah, we can't control them, but what if somebody on purpose creates something malevolent? And that's strictly the hardest problem in that whole equation. Even if you succeed at developing a friendly system, what stops from uh, someone from on purpose modifying it in certain ways? Right. What are the ways? Because I want to actually come from the abstract to concrete things, right? What are the ways where AI already manifests itself where we don't realize, right? Because in the beginning of our conversation, you've mentioned that, you know, you can claim that anything that makes a if-then decision is already a form of intelligence because it makes a decision based on something. For the general public, like what would be the surprising places where actually AI is used and we don't really realize? So I would guess government has a lot of agencies which are technically very advanced. You can think of things like NSA, uh, which uh, relies on some of this advanced AI, which we don't know about. Mm -hmm. Historically, we know they are at least a couple of years ahead of everyone else. So I don't have any insider information. And if I did, I couldn't tell you. That would kill me. But... Uh, I'm guessing they have a lot of impact on global politics and uh, security of countries using this technology, and we don't know about it. Hmm. With all these speculations occasionally popping up about you know one country influencing the election of another country, what what are your thoughts on that in general? Is it going on? What's the extent? Um, I'm sure all countries try to have some role to play in elections of other countries. It's uh, beneficial to them, but uh, it depends on how it's done. If it's uh, lying and bribing and blackmail, or is it actually revealing truthful information about the dictator? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a good point because uh, really again, depends. So, in yeah. science, we we kind of rely on external peer review, right? And if you're mm -hmm. a country, other countries are your peers. If every other country says this guy is a bad guy, they are influencing your election, but uh, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. But then again, who verifies the verifier? Who judges which values are good and which are are bad? You know. so hopefully voters have some intelligence remaining yeah. and they make that decision. Well, that's that's a, another scary part for me is that if we assume that somebody releases an agent of disinformation, right, for the short-term gain of, for example, skewing the election one way or another. So there's a lot of disinformation, a false propaganda of sorts, which divides the society which you know makes people gain false beliefs the thing is that short-term gain is for example the election day that's what you're looking for but the false beliefs are going to persist way beyond that and they're going to kind of snowball and keep snowballing because it's not like it's gonna stop and then that's it you know Come December, all the false beliefs are, are gone, all the fake news are gone, we're just back to the normal world. The truth is there, it's easy to see what is true, what is not. 
Uh, yeah, it can certainly snowball, and now you need even greater lies to impress people. They no longer go for the mild ones. So yeah, mm-hmm. long term, it's it's a lot of fake fake news, deep fakes. What is real? What is uh, simulation? Yeah, especially like what is truth? It seems such a dumb question but at the same time like what is truth in the current world where there's an abundance of information and very very often conflicting information how do you figure out which source is credible and which source actually comes from a a place that is backed up by some real data with politics, I think we can bypass this problem by realizing, okay, facts are data. Data will change, we'll get new facts. What I care about is electing an algorithm, which I support, which processes data in a certain way, scientific way, religious way, whatever. So you're voting in an algorithm, not on a data set. Can you expand on that? I'm not sure I fully understand what you mean by this. So let's say we have binary choice, two parties, and one party uses this approach to making decisions, an algorithm, Mm -hmm. and the other party uses a different approach. Now there is a fact about economy. Economy is growing at 4%. No economy is growing at 2%. You don't know what's real. It's not important to you. What's important is this algorithm or that algorithm being used for the next four years. Mm. Damn it. And then it comes back to the same of do we know what we want and what the, is the definition of winning? Because you can win the economy. Like the, if the definition is a dumb definition of we want to maximize economic growth, well, we probably need some war because historically that, that's that been a nice driver, right? Hyperinflation certainly brings up stock markets. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's clearly undesirable outcomes. Yet, you know, kind of, kind of have to be careful what you maximize for and what parameters you put in. And we're not smart enough to be able to make those decisions. Right. Wow. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, light conversation about the impeding doom for humanity. Uh, how about that? Yeah crazy and i i don't i don't even know like it, it's like what is your hope with the work that you're doing do you hope to find the solutions to the problems that you're working on and alert enough people so that the consensus understands that guys we have to proceed carefully yet we already discussed that even if everybody comes to a conclusion it's not solvable and we won't be able to control, even then it's unlikely to stop the efforts. So the best case scenario is I'm wrong, or at least it's not important in practice and maybe theoretically true. Like in math, you have theoretical proofs that Mm -hmm. you cannot prove certain things. We still do math, we still prove things, it works. So in practice, it may still be possible to get certain level of performance, which is satisfactory. We have this super intelligent assistant, which helps us cure diseases, build up our economy, solve mortality, whatever it takes, and people are better off as a result. That would be the best outcome. Mm. What if we solve mortality? Comes back to the meaning of life. Like if we are immortal. I'll have more time to think about it. You have more time to think about it. At one point, at what point would you say like, well, I, I thought about it enough. Now it's time to pull the plug. Like, how does that... Never. You, you're saying that you can get bored with infinite amount of information out there. I don't think it's the case. I think there is more books to read, more girls to date, more everything. Yeah, I can't disagree with that, but... On some level, there's some alarm bell ringing of like, are we losing something from the joy of life? Sort of, if all of a sudden there's no finite limit to it. 
You know, if right that now, was true, if that was true, you can move the limit closer and get more enjoyment. That's true, though. Yeah, you can always spice up your life by <laughs> by pulling in the slide one way or another. Yeah, but then again, if you are, if you know that you're in full control of, you know, putting it back, reverting it to sometime in the future. But still, I mean, that's a, a all a, another discussion, which is probably really crazy and I don't know I want to go there because I'm going to get all depressed but you know what it's such an interesting for me personally like to have this conversation with you I feel I find that these are not the topics that people or I normally think on a daily basis right and this is your work this is what you think about and at the same time, it's pretty clear that we will all be very much impacted and in, in some ways already are quite heavily impacted by AI and the developments and the direction this is going. And it seems like there's no consensus on how to make it secure, how to make it safe. And so basically, our faith is uh, in the hands of a few scientists and a few people in their garage. That sounds about right. That's awesome. I have a lot of job security. With technical unemployment, I'll probably be one of the few last people to lose my job. That is a really nice way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What would you suggest? Like, I would assume... At least some of the people listening to this today, they would say, do you know what? I love the topic. I want to learn more. I want to dig into AI. What can you suggest for somebody who wants to dip their toe and perhaps see if if they want to do some work in it? Well, it really depends on the background they have. Some people already have a lot of mathematical background, science background. It's quite easy to take some online courses in that case. Just pick up what you're interested in. If you are in a completely different area, it may take a little more effort. Uh, really unique to each person. You have to customize this solution. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of work which is useful outside of technical AI safety in governance of AI and ethics. Uh, so you can be in government working on a policy advice. Mm-hmm. Depends on what your interests are. And what are some of the applications of AI that are currently being worked on that are that you are the most enthusiastic about? So there is tremendous, tremendous wealth of uh, interesting work. I uh, like bringing things together. So people working on integration of human brain and computers Mm -hmm. uh, for me is very exciting. It gives us better understanding of both. And some argue that it's a way to keep up and compete with machines. We can enhance ourselves. So there is some interesting novel work. Uh, Elon Musk and Neuralink uh, doing some early testing on animals. Uh, But again, in almost every domain, I can find something fascinating coming up. Mm -hmm. This is actually a really interesting thing, this neural link with their, you know, if you listen to what Elon Musk is saying, it seems like they're not that far off. Well, I mean, he's always very optimistic with his timeline, but this some some form of integration, real integration, we're not that far away from that. I mean, this type of research has been going on for a while and there is some good work. The problem, of course, is that you have to go in. It's not just external sensors. You have to open up your skull. Mm. You have to go in. That's always a huge bottleneck. I don't want to have brain surgery just to play some video games. So mm-hmm. until they can do much better I don't think it's going to go viral. Right. Well, but imagine the world where, never mind the poker bot, you have a microchip in your brain and you are the poker bot. That's uh, That seems a bit of a scary 
probability? I mean, it depends on what capabilities you get as a result. One of them is that uh, your memories, your algorithms can be copied and you become essentially immortal, will have a backup of you. So that could be beneficial, especially in certain situations. Mm, yeah, I can think of many situations where that's indeed quite beneficial. But also like a beautiful concept of saving your memories and remembering them in the state that they happened. Memories fade. Like mm -hmm. we don't have good memories. And most of our memories are really fake. We don't even remember things as they happened. So yeah, that's another scary part. Absolutely. And you change. You forget so much that you become a different person. And if you had an option of either better remembering or reinforcing those memories, maybe mm. you'll have a more stable personality yeah. for better or worse. Yeah. And Roman, what can we learn from the machines and algorithms about how we learn, how we as humans learn? Garbage in, garbage out. Okay. If your data, what you're learning on is bad, you are unlikely to learn good things. So be careful with your reading diet, the movies you watch, the friends you have. Pick your data carefully. That sounds, sounds like quite a task. I can imagine myself because, you know, you... you you gave me this idea of I'm I'm sure now if I click a like on something I'm gonna be forced to click a like on something else just to balance things out. And that that's gonna be a fun uh, fun moment. But also like apart like beyond the garbage in garbage out, if we consider the data set of information, a vast data set, which more and more Currently, we have to, as humans, sort of make sense of the data because there's just abundance of data, more and more data every day. And for example, in poker, when you're studying poker, there's more and more data, the better and better solvers. And yet, to learn something from it, we need to distill it to concepts. We need to try to under, uh, get out the underlying ideas, to try to figure out what is the thread here. Is the way that the computer learns in the neural nets, can it inform us humans about some more efficient, more efficient approaches to processing data? Definitely, and it finds novel patterns in data we haven't seen before, mm, trying to kind of slice reality at different places, more natural joints, so we better understand large amounts of data. We're not very good at processing terabytes of data, mm. but machines can help with that. Because you know, one, one thing um, that I found really interesting with the AlphaZero, uh, the chess AI, is that, well, first of all, okay, it's, it's incredibly strong as a chess engine. And at the same time, it's so different to the existing chess engines, let's say the Stockfish or any other brute force chess engine, because if we quote unquote look like it thinks as a human for us, you know, visually, spatially, when we look at the games that the Alpha Zero plays, we can see the patterns and we can say, okay, I can understand that. I can see the pattern here. I can see where this is going. Whereas with the brute force algorithm, you can just shrug your shoulders and you say, well, okay, it calculates 50 moves in advance. We can't really do much with that, right? So in many ways, the Alpha Zero and those projects improve the way that the chess players approach learning the game because it shows them the new novel ideas of, oh, you know what? These things you need to look at. We saw it a lot with the game of Go. Yeah, It really played a completely different game after thousands of years of human play. It was just trying things we considered to be either bad or dead ends, and it was succeeding with them, so it updated the game a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, this also is happening in, in poker as well, because you know some of the plays that are clearly optimal are not so intuitive. 
not so easy to 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 arrive at. And I just wonder, what other domains do you think are most likely going to benefit from these novel approaches of humans? And I don't mean just benefit from the algorithms actually solving something for us, but algorithms showing us the way of a new way to think about a problem. So if you consider us simply learning a new way to self-improve, then all domains, that's going to happen everywhere. But if you actually care about better outcome, the algorithm is going to be superior. Once it's teaching us, we are always going to be at the same level pretty much, whereas the algorithm will continue improving. So, hmm. That's a scary notion that even if we improve the way we approach the learning process, we still have no chance against the algorithm. And that is that is the sad reality, yeah. Roman, you know what? Uh, I really want to thank you for, for your time. This has been one of the conversations, and I don't know if I have ever had a conversation like this where I'm probably going to sit in a dark room now for an hour just to try to understand what does this mean. and. Uh, yeah thank you so much for for sharing sharing your ideas and and your work and uh can you give a few words and i'm definitely gonna put all the links um to your work in the description but can you give a few words and pointers for people where to find more about the work that you're doing and where to reach out to you where to find you yeah you can follow me on twitter i post lots of uh, relevant information links papers talks podcasts you can follow me on Twitter. You can follow me on Facebook. Just don't follow me home. It's very important. <laughs> don't follow me home. That's that's beautiful. Roman, I feel like it's a great way to, to end uh, on the don't follow me home um, idea. Thank you again. It's been, it's been so insightful. Thank you for inviting me. I greatly enjoyed all the wonderful questions. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Now check out the description. You will find the links to some of Dr. Yampolsky's work and maybe you'll be interested to check out some of my other podcast episodes. Also, if you'd like to receive a regular newsletter with my key takeaways about each episode, go ahead and subscribe to it on runchexpodcast.com. That's R-U-N-C-H-U-K-S podcast.com. I write those myself. I take it seriously and I really enjoy the interaction with the readers. So I hope you'll sign up and I'll be back for you next time. Thank you.